This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 93. Coming up on Space Time. The micro quasar blasting gamma rays towards Earth. The alien asteroid Amaomao posing new mysteries. And its mission end for NASA's planet hunting Kepler Space Telescope. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have detected high-energy gamma rays violently blasting out of a microquasar within the Milky Way galaxy. The microquasar, named SS433, is about 15,000 light-years from Earth. It comprises twin jets beaming deep into the galaxy. The jets are being generated by a stellar-mass black hole in a binary system, feeding off material it's dragging off a companion star. A report in the journal Nature claims the discovery strongly suggests that electron acceleration, together with collisions at the end of the microquasar's jets, are producing the powerful gamma rays. The discovery is important because it offers a glimpse into more extreme events happening at the centres of other galaxies, which involve larger quasars being generated by supermassive black holes. The authors gathered their data using the high-altitude water Cherenkov Gamma Ray Observatory, The detectors designed to look for gamma ray emissions coming from astronomical objects such as supernova remnants, quasars and pulsars. Scientists have detected over a dozen microquasars in the Milky Way, but only a couple of them appear to emit high-energy gamma rays. With SS-433's close proximity and orientation to Earth, scientists had a rare opportunity to observe the extraordinary astrophysics taking place. The study's lead author, Professor Jordan Goodman from the University of Maryland, says SS-433 is right in our local stellar neighbourhood. So, using the high-altitude water Cherenkov Gamma Ray Observatory's unique wide-field view allowed his team to resolve both microquasar particle acceleration sites. By combining these observations with multi-wavelength and multi-messenger data from other telescopes, Goodman and colleagues can improve their understanding of particle acceleration in SS-433 and then extrapolate that data to their giant extragalactic cousins, the quasars produced by supermassive black holes. Those quasars are powerful enough to be seen right across the universe, visible some 13 billion light-years away. But because they're so far away, most known quasars have only been detected when their jets are aimed directly at Earth, just like only noticing a distant flashlight when it's aimed directly at you. In contrast, SS-433's jets are oriented away from the Earth and the high-altitude water Cherenkov Gamma Ray Observatory was able to detect similar energetic light coming from the microquasar side. Regardless of where they originate from, the gamma rays involved always travel in straight lines to their destination. The ones that arrive at Earth then collide with molecules in the atmosphere, creating newer particles and lower energy gamma rays. And each new particle then slams into more stuff in the atmosphere, creating what's called a particle shower as the signal cascades towards the ground. The high-altitude water Cherenkov Gamma Ray Observatory is located roughly 4,115 metres, or 13,500 feet above sea level, near the Sierra Negra volcano in Mexico. The detector is amazingly simple. It's composed of 300 tanks of pristine distilled water, each tank being about 8 metres in diameter. When the particles hit the water, they're moving so fast, they produce shock waves of blue light called Cherenkov radiation. Special cameras in the tank then observe this light, allowing scientists to determine the origin of the gamma rays. To reach their conclusions, the authors of our story examined some 1,017 days' worth of data, finding evidence that the gamma rays they were seeing were coming from the ends of the microquasar's jets, rather than from the central part of the star system. Based on their analyses, the authors concluded that the electrons they were seeing in the jets attain energies that are about a thousand times higher than anything can be achieved in earthbound particle accelerators such as the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. The authors hypothesized the jets' electrons then collide with low-energy microwave background radiation which permeates space, resulting in gamma-ray emission. If they're right, this is a new mechanism for generating high-energy gamma rays in this type of system, and is different from what scientists have observed when quasars' jets are pointed directly at Earth. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. A new 
new study has placed new size limits on how big that strange-looking interstellar asteroid Maumau is likely to be. The findings, reported in the Astronomical Journal, suggest the alien visitor is far brighter and consequently smaller than originally estimated, possibly as small as 100 metres or less. Back in November 2017, scientists pointed NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope towards the object in order to study it at infrared wavelengths. They found a Mau Mau was too faint for Spitzer to detect when it looked more than two months after the object's closest approach to Earth in early September of that year. However, the non-detection puts new limits on how large the strange-shaped asteroid's likely to be. The study's lead author, Professor David Trilling from North Arizona University, says the very fact that a Mau Mau is too small for Spitzer to detect is actually a very valuable result. He says a Mau Mau has been full of surprises from day one, and scientists were eager to see what Spitzer might show. The new size limit follows observations earlier this year suggesting that outgassing could be responsible for slight variations in a Mau Mau's speed and direction, which were detected as it was being tracked last year. The hypothesis being that the expelled gas is acting something like tiny thrusters, gently pushing the object in different directions and at different speeds. That determination was dependent on a Mau Mau being relatively smaller than most typical solar system comets. Subsequent detailed observations conducted by multiple ground-based telescopes and NASA's Hubble Space Telescope detected the sunlight being reflected off a Mau Mau's surface. Large variations in the object's brightness suggested that a Mau Mau is highly elongated and probably less than a kilometre in its longest dimension. But Spitzer tracks asteroids and comets using the infrared energy or heat that they radiate, and that can provide more specific information about an object's size than optical observations of reflected sunlight alone could. You see, the fact that a Mau Mau was too faint for Spitzer to detect sets limits on the object's overall surface area. However, because the non-detection can't be used to infer shape, the size limits were presented as what a Mau Mau's diameter would be if it were spherical. Using three separate models to make slightly different assumptions about the object's composition, Spitzer's non-detection limited a Mau Mau's spherical diameter to either 440 metres, 140 metres, or perhaps as little as 100 metres. The wide range of results stems from the assumptions about a Mau Mau's composition, which influences how visible or faint it would appear to Spitzer were at a particular size. The new study also suggests that a Mau Mau may be up to 10 times more reflective than the comets which reside in our solar system, and according to the paper's authors, that was a surprising result. Because infrared light is largely heat radiation produced by warm objects, it can be used to determine the temperature of a comet or asteroid. And in turn, that can then be used to determine the reflectivity of the object's surface, what astronomers call albedo. Just like a black t-shirt in sunlight heats up more quickly than a white one, an object with low reflectivity retains more heat than an object with high reflectivity. So a lower temperature means a higher albedo. Now, a comet's albedo can change throughout its lifetime. When a comet passes close to the sun, its ice is warm and sublimate into space as gas, in the process sweeping dust and dirt off the comet's surface and therefore revealing more reflective ice. But a Mau Mau has been travelling through interstellar space for millions and millions of years, far from any star that could refresh its surface. But it may have had its surface refreshed through such outgassing when it made its extremely close approach to the Sun a little more than five weeks before it was discovered. In addition to sweeping away the dirt and dust, some of this released gas may have covered the surface of a Mau Mau with a reflective coat of ice and snow. That's a phenomenon which has also been observed on comets in our solar system. A Mau Mau is now almost as far from the Sun as Saturn's orbit, and it's speeding back into deep space well beyond the reach of our existing telescopes. First discovered on October the 19th, 2017, the strange-looking cigar-shaped object was originally catalogued as A2017U1, and then 1I2017U1, and then later named Mau Mau, an Hawaiian word meaning a distant visitor arriving for the first time. It was initially detected by the University of Hawaii's PanStars-1 telescope as part of NASA's search for NEOs or near-Earth objects, celestial bodies which could pose a threat to our planet. At the time of its discovery, it was estimated to be about 400 metres long. This was later revised down to 180 metres by 30 metres in size. A Mau Mau dropped into our solar system from the direction of the constellation Lyra, cruising through interstellar space at 25.5 kilometres per second. It approached our solar system from almost directly above the ecliptic, the orbital plane upon which the planets and most of the asteroids orbit the Sun. 
Now, this means it didn't have any close encounters with the eight major planets during its plunge towards the Sun. Then, on September 2, 2017, it crossed just under the ecliptic, inside Mercury's orbit, making its closest approach to the Sun a week later on September 9. Pulled by the Sun's gravity, Amalmao made a hairpin turn under our solar system, passing under Earth's orbit on October 14 at a distance of about 24 million kilometres, about 60 times the distance to the Moon. The Sun's gravity assist had flung a Mau Mau like a slingshot, accelerating it to a speed of 44 km per second relative to the Sun, and onto a trajectory heading towards the constellation Pegasus. Initial estimates indicate a Mau Mau was now speeding through the solar system at an astonishing 64,374 km per hour. Its high rate of speed and orbit was proof that a Mau Mau couldn't have originated from within our solar system or even from the surrounding Oort cloud of tag-along objects travelling with our solar system around the galaxy. A Mau Mau is usually referred to as an asteroid rather than a comet because observations haven't detected any volatile gas emissions usually seen coming from comets when they're near the Sun. Things like the nebulous envelope of gas and dust called a coma surrounding the object or an iconic cometary tail. Of course, the absence of a fuzzy halo or signature tail doesn't mean it's not a comet, a possibility that's been further reinforced by the new measurements showing the objects accelerating and changing course, which suggests some sort of outgassing of volatiles is occurring. Mau Mau passed the distance of Jupiter's orbit in early May 2018, and it will pass the distance of Saturn's orbit in January next year. It'll reach a distance corresponding to Uranus's orbit in August 2020 and that of Neptune in late June 2024. By late 2025, a Mau Mau will have reached the outer edge of the Kuiper Belt, and then the heliopause the edge of our solar system in November 2038, after which time it'll be back into interstellar space. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr. Fred Watson. Uh, It's back in the news because there's now some speculation that it might actually be artificial. So... And the word alien has popped up. I haven't used that one myself, but it is being used. So where are we at here? Are we talking a big pile of doogie here? <laughs> Look, we're still talking about an asteroid, I think. Let's recap again. Umuamua, a Hawaiian word meaning a messenger from a, uh, the first messenger from afar, I think, if, uh, if I remember rightly, chosen because this object was discovered by a telescope at Haleakala on the island of Maui in the Hawaiian Islands. This thing passed through the solar system around about a year ago, October, November last year, and its velocity was such that we immediately knew that it wasn't something that belonged to the solar system. It passed through on a trajectory which brought it in from outside and will take it outside again mm. as it carries on on its on its journey through space. So very exciting stuff. It was the first interstellar asteroid. Now, there was some debate at the time as to what this object was. Was it an asteroid or was it a comet? And the, the difference between them is that basically asteroids are, are rocky, comets are icy. That's the, the you know the, the bottom line, although comets also include a lot of dust in them. The weird thing is that it was long and thin, as you've described. So graphically, if I might say, it's something like a quarter of a kilometre long, or 250 metres or 250 yards or thereabouts, by about 40 metres and cigar-shaped, and tumbling end over end so that it had, I think it's got a rotation period or a tumble period of something like eight hours something of that sort. And it was that tumbling, of course, and the way its brightness changed that allowed astronomers to work out more or less what its shape was. What really sort of clinched the idea that it was an asteroid is that people observed it as closely as they could, given that it had already passed its its closest to the sun, and indeed its closest to the earth. They observed it to look for any evidence of what we call outgassing. This is material coming off the surface, which is typical of what happens to comets when they get reasonably close to the sun, uh, and that the gas comes off and is excited to glow, which is why we think of comets as being these very bright objects traveling through our night skies. However, nothing was seen in that regard, uh, and so the conclusion came that it was an asteroid. And in fact, its color, it's a slightly reddish color, is also consistent with a rocky surface that's been bombarded for a long time, millions of years, by cosmic rays, the the, the subatomic particles that really permeate the whole of space. So that sort of seemed to put the lid on the discovery, except that there were slight peculiarities in its trajectory. 
And this sort of led to the idea of it being a comet being reopened because it experienced some accelerations that could really only be explained if something was pushing it slightly. Mm. And so the suggestion is that perhaps it was actually outgassing. There were plumes of gas coming from this thing which were providing an acceleration, changing its orbit very slightly. We can detect these things very accurately, Andrew. That's why little nitty-gritty things like this crop up. So that was speculated, although once again there was no sign of any cometary outgassing. So what has now happened is a paper which has been produced by scientists at Harvard University in the USA. And I have to say that its lead author is a, somebody who's always a bit provocative when it comes to this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. But the paper is really about what could be causing this acceleration. And a lot of the paper is about the idea of radiation pressure from the sun, giving this acceleration that Oumuamua seemed to exhibit. So that was the bulk of the paper. But right at the end, there is a little bit that says, uh, what about speculating that this is actually a light sail, that this thing is an artificial spacecraft with a light sail which is receiving the sun's radiation and that's causing it to accelerate. So the authors of the paper immediately get into highly speculative regions and a lot of there have, has been a lot of commentary by other astronomers on this saying, why do you go to the, the least likely explanation of this, uh, you know, of whatever this phenomenon might be? It gets attention well, and it gets you noticed. Yes. And, I, I and think the, media's, the media's unwritten rule is never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So they've <laughs> latched on to the least likely situation and it's become the lead. That's what I reckon. Well, that's of course, that's right. That's that's what it's all about. It's Avi Loeb is the, um, the chief author. He's Put, put this idea out. It certainly causes a stir in the world. It's got pub, uh, some publicity for the Harvard Astronomy Department and uh, Avi Loeb, the chairman of that department. This scientist I might mention is also the one who speculated that fast radio bursts, which are something else that currently don't hang have on, an explanation. On, fast radio bursts. That's the one, fast radio bursts, yes. Right. Uh, the, exactly as we were t- speaking. That Those are the result of aliens using lasers to propel light sails through the universe. He's very keen on the idea of light sails and clearly brings them into any conversation where it seems relevant. Fair enough. I, I, I actually don't have a problem with that. I think it's good to put these ideas out there. And I think, uh, you know, at the same time, it's also good to realise that they are highly speculative. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister programme, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Just days after the end of NASA's Dawn mission to the main asteroid belt, mission managers have wished a fond farewell to another tireless space workhorse, the planet-hunting Kepler Space Telescope. On the evening of Thursday, November the 15th, Kepler received its final set of commands to disconnect all communications with Earth. The goodnight commands finalised the spacecraft's transition into retirement, which began on October 30th with confirmation by NASA that Kepler had run out of fuel and could no longer conduct science. Coincidentally, Kepler's goodnight falls on the same date as the 388-year anniversary of the death of its namesake, the German astronomer Johannes Kepler, who discovered the laws of planetary motion and passed away on November 15th, 1630. The final commands were sent over NASA's Deep Space Communications Network from Kepler's Operations Center at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Kepler's team disabled the safety modes that could inadvertently turn systems back on and severed communications by shutting down the transmitters. Because the spacecraft's slowly spinning, the Kepler team had to carefully time the command so the instructions would reach the spacecraft during periods of viable communication. The team will now monitor the spacecraft for some time to ensure the commands were successful. Kepler is now drifting in a safe orbit around the Sun, some 151 million kilometres from Earth. The Planet Hunting Space Telescope was designed to stare at a single region of space in the direction of the northern constellations of Cygnus, Lyra and Draco, searching for any slight changes in light coming from some of the 150,000 stars in its field of view. You see, those changes could signify a planet passing or transiting in front of the star as seen from Kepler's position, eclipsing or blocking out some of that starlight. 
During its 9.6-year mission, Kepler discovered some 2,662 confirmed exoplanets. It observed 530,506 stars and documented some 61 supernovae events. The discoveries made by Kepler have resulted in the publication so far of 2,946 scientifically peer-reviewed papers. Kepler has proven there are more planets than stars in our galaxy, and knowing that revolutionizes our understanding of our place in the cosmos. Kepler has also shown that the Milky Way is teeming with terrestrial-sized planets, and many of them may be similar to Earth in size and distance from their parent stars. The most recent analysis of Kepler's discoveries includes that 20-50% to 50 of all stars in the sky are likely to have small rocky planets that are in the habitable zones of their stars, places where liquid water, essential for life as we know it, can pool on the planetary surface. Kepler's also discovered a diversity of planetary types. But interestingly, the most common size of planet found by Kepler doesn't exist in our solar system. These are worlds known as super-Earths, which are somewhere between the size of Earth and the size of Neptune. Kepler's also shown scientists that while the Sun's inner solar system has just four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, Kepler's found other systems with up to eight terrestrial planets orbiting close into their host stars. The existence of all these compact systems raises new questions about how stellar systems form. Are planets born close to their parent stars, or do they form further out and then migrate inwards? Besides introducing a golden age of exoplanetary discovery, Kepler's also reinvigorated the study of stars, observing more than half a million stars over the course of its nine years of operation. Kepler's observations of so many stars was essential to understanding the basic properties of the planets that orbit them. Kepler's also captured the beginning stages of exploding stars called supernovae with unprecedented precision, providing new clues about how these stellar explosions begin. The data collected by Kepler over the course of its operations is still being analysed and mined for new discoveries, discoveries which will help keep producing scientific papers for many, many years to come. The scientists and engineers who worked on Kepler have praised the many accomplishments of this historic mission, which has changed science's understanding of the universe and our place in it. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has found that coffee drinkers love the bitter taste of caffeine, while tea lovers absolutely hate it. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, are based on data from the UK Biobank linking genetic variants associated with the perception of three bitter substances, caffeine, quinine and propylthyrosyl, PROP, with people's preferences for drinking tea, coffee or alcohol. The study found those who were more sensitive to the bitterness of caffeine usually drank more coffee but less tea. But for both the other bitter variants, the effect was the opposite. Those who were more sensitive to quinine and prop drank less coffee but more tea. For alcohol, people who were more sensitive to prop tended to hit the bottle less, but the other two variants had no effect. The findings show that genetic differences may help determine whether people end up being tea or coffee drinkers. Apple has launched a new online tool that lets users download, change or delete all the data Apple's collected on them. The tool was initially rolled out for users in the European Union in response to the EU's data protection laws. It's now available on the Apple privacy website for users in the United States, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. A new study claims that red-brown and blue-green pigments found in birds' eggs first evolved when our feathered friends were still dinosaurs. A report in the journal Nature analysed fossil eggshells of all the major dinosaur groups. It found preserved pigments in spotted and speckled patterns in the shells of the dinosaur group known as theropods, the group which includes modern birds. Eggs from dinosaur groups that were less closely related to birds, including Triceratops and Diplodocus, did not contain any pigments, and so would have been plain in colour. Glyphosate, the active herbal ingredient widely used in weed killers like Roundup, has been discovered in common brands of dog and cat foods. The Cornell University study, reported in the journal Environmental Pollution, found glyphosate present in low levels in 18 different pet food brands purchased at local stores, including one claiming to be GMO-free. The glyphosate concentrations ranged from 80 to 2,000 micrograms per kilogram, and it's still considered a safe level for human consumption. 
One surprising finding of the study was that the glyphosate detected in the one GMO-free product the researchers analysed was at levels higher than those in several of the processed feeds. The study suggests that keeping feedstocks uncontaminated is a real challenge, even in the GMO-free market. The scientific method involves observation, hypothesis, experimentation, analysis and conclusion. Science is all about critical thinking. It's a search for the truth. Don't just take someone's word for it. Test the claim. See if it's factual and stands up, or if it's just a great steaming pile of woo. That's what skepticism's all about, a search for the truth. And remember, scientific facts don't care if you like them or not. The notorious 2018 Bent Spoon Award, the highest dishonour in Australian scepticism, has this year been awarded to a social media blogger who claims she cured her cervical dysplasia using nothing but the power of prayer, holistic treatments, lifestyle changes and sheer willpower. With the details, we're joined by Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. This is something that we've given out every year since about the mid-80s. We have a Ben Spoon Award, which is, of course, uh, bent by Yuri Geller himself. It's mounted on wood from Noah's Ark, etc. It's getting very heavy these days because we have to add more levels all the time. But this year in uh, 2018, the Ben Spoon went to a young woman who has a podcast and YouTube channels and Instagram, all that sort of stuff. She has over a million followers. And unfortunately, she's promoting pseudo medicine ideas. And it's especially because that her audience is, again, young women. She's an attractive sort of person. She's obviously very appealing. And the thing she's telling, specifically in this case, was that she had cured her precancerous condition that was cervical dysplasia. And she had done it with uh, the power of natural medicine, food, lifestyle changes and prayer. Now, the trouble is that this particular condition, which is caused by the HPV, human papillomavirus, Cancer Council says that there is no evidence that there is anything a woman can do in terms of diet and lifestyle to promote regression of this. So obviously there's a lot of issues there as to we're assuming, and we don't have any reason not to, that she really did have cervical dysplasia. But the fact that she's giving these natural medicines and lifestyle changes and prayer as the reason she cured it is a great worry because obviously a lot of other young women who are very fearful of this obviously would then follow suit and the trouble is they're not going to see their doctors they're not going to sort of go through proper medical processes they're going to just turn to green goop that's tim mendham from australian skeptics you're listening to space time i'm Stuart gary and that's the show for now you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.